Hello to everyone who's joining. Um, we're just going to wait for people to sort of stream into the event and get settled, grab a drink, um, and then we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes and then we'll get started on the dot. Um, yeah, so if you've got any questions actually, uh, while we wait, just feel free to uh, post them in the chat. Maybe you've come with a question. Um, we've got a pretty sort of solid idea of what we're going to be talking about today, but for the question and answer session at the end, I'm sure the three of us can definitely get stuck into some of those questions you might have um, come to the session with. So just let us know what those are in the comments and we'll get started in a minute or two. Actually, as you come in, uh, let us know where you're from. Um, we've had Hitesh tell us that he's from Pune in India. How, I don't know if I said that right. I, I'm 100% certain I did not say that correctly. So um, let me know how that should be pronounced. Uh, maybe if you can do a phonetic spelling in the chat, that would be great. Um, Hello, Mars from Netherlands, Copenhagen. Amazing. Um, this is a global webinar already. Um, I love it. Um, the US, amazing. How do you say this? Lagrange? I hope that's correct. <laughs> Nikki from the UK, welcome. Good stuff. So we'll just give it a few more seconds and then we'll get started. Uh, Kian from UK as well. Cohen from Canada. I love this. This is amazing. Atlanta. We haven't had the same place twice. So I love this. Uh, very few say it correctly. La Grange. So great job. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Akir from Switzerland. I love it. This is really good. Okay. Keep those. Keep those coming in. We're going to. Um, we're going to. We want to know where everyone's from. Uh, that in itself is a wonderful data set for each and every one of these webinars. Um, Today's session is essentially about quantified self and where to start. Um, it's the first of uh, four uh, webinars we've got over the course of the next month, essentially covering the topic of quantified self. And so what we thought we'd do today is just start by talking about, you know, how to get started. I think quantified self is something that a lot of people see, especially as data professionals, you see it, you're very passionate about getting into it, but you maybe have this perception that you need to have been collecting data for some time to get into it. Or maybe you have this sort of um, uh, view that it's maybe hard to get hold of certain data sets. So what we wanted to do today is just get three of us who've you know done a bit of quantified self in various forms to sort of give you a variety of ways that you can get started, um, right from very simple techniques, um, you know, where you can go scrape data from things you already have, all the way to slightly more you know technical examples where you can use APIs to go out and get information from various systems. Um, so that's basically the the gist of today. I'm going to start with introductions. Um, my name is Tim. I'm the host of the session today. Um, I've been in the information lab for quite some time, a bit of an old hat here. Um, but essentially, um, for Quantified Self, I've been looking at my own data sets for, for a long, long time, partly to try and improve the quality of my life and try and sort of uh, deal with certain challenges that I've personally had, but also to try and um, add some sort of measurement to some of my exploits, because I think we all have a, a sense of how things um, supposed to go. But actually, when you look at the data, you realize that the story is slightly different. So that's uh, pretty much um, it for me. I'll hand over to Ellie, who will do a brief introduction as well. Uh, hi, I'm Ellie. Uh, I was also at the Information Lab, part of Data School 11. Um, so I recently just graduated, so I'm now a DS alumni. Um, and I have been running for, you know, started running back in 2016. And since then, given that I was new, um, I basically was driver from get go. I wanted to see myself improve. Um, and so quantified self for me is uh, similar to what Tim said in terms of having particular goals in mind and seeing how how your data then improves or changes is pretty cool. But also I've also done quantified self collect data collection myself, whether that's um, non-fitness stuff. So um, I recently began looking at Carcassonne and board game data and creating a, a data scorecard to then visualize mostly because I find that I really enjoy the visualization process, but I really enjoy it a lot more when I'm invested in the data and when I can then see the patterns and the personal story coming out in the data itself. So, yeah. uh, I'll pass over to Jenny. Thanks, Ellie. Um, so, yep, my name is Jenny, and I am part of the data school at the moment, part of data school 14. So I've been with the information lab for coming up to two years now, which is a bit scary, getting ready to graduate soon. Um, and quantified self for me I guess that um, when I bought a Fitbit it was just you know to look at the steps but 
I found myself being more and more interested with looking at sleep data. So like every day you can kind of get a snapshot of how you slept, but that's not really enough. There's not enough within the app as it stands itself. I want to see more over time, more trends. Um, so for me, um, it's more about I'm just interested in looking at this thing every single day. I want to see more from it. And obviously getting the data for yourself and playing around with it is always more fun than just using pre-built charts. So that's kind of where I'm coming from uh, for this. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. It's always fascinating. I've never I've never met two people who come at quantified stuff from the same angle. I think we're all trying to understand different things about our lives and about the things we want to do and achieve in life. And I think it's such a great practice, especially as data professionals, to sort of not only you know get to know yourself a little bit better. Um, sounds a little bit narcissistic, but <laughs> um, it's something that we all strive to do um, a bit better in our lives. But also, it's a really fun way of sort of getting sharper with your data and analytics skills because you know yourself really 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 well so when the data starts to sort of go wrong you see it instantly and it's a nice sort of craft to sort of um, develop yourself um what i wanted to do is essentially start by you know really tackling this topic of uh, how do you start from a, a place where you don't have something today maybe you, you're just thinking about quantified stuff you've seen some awesome thing maybe sleep data maybe other data sets but you didn't sort of think to start tracking them a while back. So how, how do you sort of take on that challenge? Um, and this is something that I've been really sort of interested in because I'm a firm believer that when you're tracking um, you know, information about yourself, some of the best tracking methods are passive because I don't know about you, but if I have to remember to do something, I'm really bad at remembering. I'm also inconsistent. So um, a, a good one is tracking mood, for example. When you track your mood, uh, you have to open your phone and hit you know, a survey and fill it in and choose your mood and, and do it. Unless the app or the way you're doing that is randomly selecting different points in the day, you, you tend to only ever track the, the times when you're not happy and the times when you're not, you know, feeling so good because there's almost like a natural trigger in your mind to go and, you know, track these things. But when things are going really well, let's say in your great mood, you don't sort of stop and think, let me pull out my phone and track that I'm in a great mood. It just doesn't work like that. So you really need to sort of develop uh, principles and practices that allow you to do all this um, stuff passively. And so what I wanted to do today is just sort of start to show you how you can tackle that with something as simple as your phone, because your phone is the device that's nearly always with you. For most people, they're with the devices pretty much all day. And um, as we move forward in technology, there's other devices as well, like smartwatches or you know running trackers or Fitbits and stuff like that, that also track data passively that is really, really valuable. So if we just, um, if we just take, um, oh, if I go back, if we just take a typical um, watch and phone, um, these are the sensors that are actually in each and every one of these devices. And the key thing to bear in mind with these sensors is they're on all the time. They're not just you know you know switching on or whatever. They they are nearly always active. They're designed to be always collecting information um, as as you use them. So a compass, um, GPS for location, gyroscopes for sensing you know the movements that your device is doing, um, accelerometers, a camera, touch sensitivity, vision, computer vision a really sort of nice thing you can do on modern phones at least in the last two years is you can sort of hold up a camera to to someone and they can use something called computer vision to figure out how tall you are based on their understanding of the world and and, and sort of where you're placed which is a sort of really nice feature and that in itself is a really nice data point um, if i continue on face id and touch id the devices know who you are where and, and you know whether you're paying attention or not there's a, a nice sort of little quirk of all these facial recognition um, tools, which is they don't unlock your phone unless they see that your eyes are actually looking at the screen. So a lot of people will use Face ID and they'll wonder why is it not working? And sometimes it's because you're not looking. And when the phone knows you're looking at the screen, that's another great data point um, that's um, available to you there. Um, lastly, proximity sensors, ambient light sensors, and um, a sort of a common theme across all of this is that the companies that have built these sensors have added another level of computing on top of that, which is essentially machine learning, understanding how the information that all these sensors sort of collect cumulatively leads to sort of a, another picture that they can start to sort of predict and start to see happening in a slightly different way. And so this sort of relates um, to, to real life data in the following way, steps, heart rate, weight, running and workouts. These are sort of data sets that nearly everyone is actually common with, right? And on the right hand side, I've put some sort of personal things that I'm actually able to track with my phone and it's photos, finances, music, time, logs and custom workflows. 
Now, all of these are just data sets that are sitting on your phone. And unless you sort of do something deliberate to go and capture them, uh, you, they just sort of go to waste. The other thing is that your phone is actually the most powerful device you've got available to you and to track these things. This is a slightly old slide. This is about two years old, so it's got some old looking devices. But interestingly, this relationship has stayed pretty consistent with all technology. Um, it's important to, no to note the numbers in the bottom here. These are just um, uh, performance scores for the processor inside of those devices. And your modern smartphone is actually more powerful in computing terms than most laptops. I think um, if you take the most recent iPhone, for example, it completely trounces all the um, uh, laptop-based performance scores, at least when it comes to single core performance. That is you know, one chip doing one job. And so actually these devices are not just you know, phones, they're actually really powerful computers. So they can do begin to do things like aggregate the data in really sort of meaningful ways and also keep one thing really important, which is uh, privacy. So keeping this information on your device rather than in the cloud. And so if I just iOS as an example, this is Apple Health. I'm a pretty religious user of Apple Health. Um, I have about nine gigabytes worth of data inside of Apple Health, um, according to Apple Health. So when you back it up to iCloud, it actually tells you how much storage that data takes. And it's about nine gigabytes worth of data. And it's generally across these sort of health categories you can see here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, activity, sleep, tracking, hearing, heart, all these sort of core metrics. And then the other place where you get data is when you sort of do an activity. So the fitness app on, on an Apple device, uh, all Apple devices have this. I'll come to Android devices in a second. Um, and what the phones and uh, companies have actually started to do pretty well in the last couple of years, it didn't start out like this. In the last couple of years, they've actually really brought a really critical eye to the quality of the analysis they, they provide on these devices. So if you haven't had a chance to look at this and you just want to get started with Quantified Self and your phone has been in your pocket for um, you know the last couple of years, there's probably some information in there already that you can go and look at. And this is just an example from my own um, uh, Apple Health system. But if you, you sort of go across, there's lots of different varying levels of sort of complexity and information that's available to you. And on the far right hand side, there's also this other really important concept that your data can go out to other platforms. And actually, it's really sort of well curated, at least in both Google and Apple sort of ecosystems. And you can export and import that data really, really freely. If I just switch over to Google, this is actually the Google Health app. Um, so Google and Apple have very similar apps. And this is exactly using exactly the same information. So Google have a slightly different design. And again, they do some sort of slightly Google creepy things, I'll be honest. For example, I didn't actually log my walking workout um, with uh, Google. What actually happened was um, that Google Maps on my phone is tracking my location and therefore it knows that I went on a walk, which is slightly creepy here. Um, but otherwise, all the other data is just from Apple Health. It's just getting the sleep, the heart data, the step data and heart rate from, from that. But they've all got actually pretty decent ways of actually visualizing this um, in a sort of meaningful way that's sort of easy to understand. So this is a really good place to start if you've got absolutely nothing. Uh, these devices will definitely have something that you can look at. And you might look at this data and say, well, I'm not interested in sleep. I'm not interested in uh, heart rates. So I'm not interested in steps. I'm, I'm really interested in, for example, um, the quality of some of those things. And this isn't really telling me that. Um, so I'll come to sort of address that uh, question in, in a second. If I go to the next slide, what I tried to do is I tried to just sort of visualize, well, how much information is my phone like aware of in any given day, right? What do I do through my phone in any given day? So the way I did this is I just went back through a whole year and I sort of um, averaged out, divided by the number of days, the activities essentially, and then I just sort of laid them out by this. So it's a very crude way of doing this. Um, but in, an, in a typical day, you'll take 20 photos, you, you'll obviously sleep for a certain amount of time. You maybe take some videos, listen to some music, uh, send some messages, spend some time on your computer. I have a dog, so I, I go on one and a half dog walks. I don't know why it's half a dog walk. I must not walk my dog when I'm on holiday or something, or it ends up being like half a dog walk. Um, but nevertheless, um, you can even track your location 24 seven on these devices. And not many people are aware that you can actually capture some of this information. And so um, one of the things I'm always a big proponent of is look, how much of this stuff can you track without doing absolutely anything? In fact, how much of this is already really easy to track and even go back in time and capture the data from? 
And the one example I'm going to go into in a lot of detail now is photos, but I'll also sort of touch on some other areas that you can very quickly touch on. Now, when we uh, look at sort of any data, um, specifically, um, you know, when you're on a computer or you're looking at stuff, it generates metadata. So in this particular case, um, this is actually called something called fingerprinting. So this is essentially a browser fingerprint for my activity around the web. And this is actually how, um, you know, modern media companies track your activity throughout the internet because they equate you to a bunch of attributes that they've basically pulled from your browser. And so you can actually take this sort of mentality and think about metadata, i.e. the data about the things you do in a really sort of powerful way. And so if I actually exit the full screen here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just very briefly open up a folder on my computer. And you'll see here, so this is the, this is the folder. And I took, I took some photos this morning. Uh, this is a photo of a wall. It's not very interesting. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, the photo of my garden uh, that I took in the afternoon. And then this is the photo of um, some objects that I placed on my window shelf. I just wanted to take some random objects that I could. Okay. And what I can do is I can very easily, actually, if I just open up, um, I'm going to, uh, this, this is going to get complex really fast, but it really isn't that complex. Okay. I just want to make, make sure people sort of understand that this is something that you can all do. This is not um, very, very hard to do. So there's a wonderful tool called EXIF tool. Okay. And EXIF tool basically goes into an image and extracts all the metadata that's embedded in that image. Okay. And so in order to do that, uh, to save me having to type code in front of you, I'm just going to uh, change the directory of uh, my command line here. If I just make this larger so everyone can see this more clearly. So I'm gonna to go to this images folder on my desktop, which just has those images that I showed you. And now that I'm in that particular directory, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna run um, the, this tool called EXIF tool. So if I just type in EXIF tool, and then I paste the image name, what this tool is gonna do is it's gonna to go to that image and extract all the information from it. So let's just do that. And you can see, that it instantly gets a bunch of information. And this is just one image, okay? And um, obviously it has the version, the name of the file, when it was taken, uh, which is obviously useful information. Then you start to get into the sort of the nitty gritty of the photo, the size of the photo, the device that was taken on, the rotation of the phone when I took the photo. So in this case, I had it actually sideways. Um, uh, the resolution, which is just a screen resolution, there's nothing sort of great there the details about the camera and the uh, settings on the camera when the photo was taken, which is already sort of useful information. But it doesn't stop there because it also has information about the device itself, has information about the location. So it's got pretty thorough details here about the exact location. Now, this isn't as accurate as like, you know, an F1 car's GPS. It's accurate to about five to 10 meters but it's good enough for you to get location data out of it, which is absolutely uh, sort of a pretty common use case. And it even has things like the device, you know, when was the device last switched on and off? Uh, and so all of this sort of gets dumped into the photo. And uh, a common mistake people make when they use social media is they don't remove this information. So it's really common for people to go to someone's Twitter image, right, and just grab the image, put it through this tool, and then they find out information about where the photo was taken. That's actually how some celebrities sometimes get outed for saying they were doing one thing when in fact they were elsewhere. Um, but this is all really useful sort of data from a quantified self perspective, because you can actually capture this and harness it to, to, to do a, a bunch of different things. Notice it's even got the uh, altitude above sea level, as well as the, um, I think it's, it's basically my, uh, this GPS information here is um, sort of northerns and eastings in this particular context, but it's also got some information about um, which way I was facing, my field of view and all that kind of information, and even speed if I was moving whilst that happened. So this is a very rich data set. And actually, you can infer a lot of other things from this. For example, when the photo is taken, when there's a certain level of brightness and a certain sort of type of setting, bearing in mind that our phones are basically on automatic all the time, you can actually use that to go and, um, you know, figure out whether it was sunny or cloudy. But you're probably wondering, well, this is great. This is one image. How do I do this for a whole directory? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I've just um, copied some 
some text. Again, this is how simple it is. Exif tool, I've asked it to export a CSV and I've asked it, I've asked it to uh, call it exif.csv. Uh, what I'll actually do is, because I've already got a file in here, I'll say uh, call it three, just so it doesn't clash. Hit enter and you'll see that it scanned one directory with those three images and that's pretty much ready to go. Now, if I go back to um, my folder, you'll see that I have this uh, CSV here. So let's just open that up. I will wait for that to open. It's of course opened on another screen. So let me drag it onto the screen. And here we are, we have that data as a CSV. So as a very simple data set, if you've ever taken photos for the last decade, well, you've suddenly got a really rich location data set. If you've ever wondered, you know, what devices and phones have you used and you've still got your photos maybe on a, on a hard drive or something, again, you've got some really rich information. But you can also start to use this along with other sort of very intelligent ways of processing data uh, to go and get some stories, essentially, that you can start to tell yourself. Um, and if you sort of think of most data sets this way, don't just think of them of what they are. Think of what else they could be. Um, the best example I have before I finish is um, I was working for a client and um, uh, I essentially got into this pattern of always going to the gents at a certain time. Now, the weird thing is that the Apple Watch was starting to recognize that there was I was experiencing a loud sound at certain times in the day. And I really couldn't figure out what was going on. And I thought about my journey to work. I was like, there's nowhere I can think of where I'm standing next to something that would sound like, you know, an airplane taking off. And Actually, one time I went to the gents and this time I actually caught the notification and my watch was basically telling me that the sound was really loud. And that's because my watch was right underneath the hand dryer. And so I thought about that for one second. I just realized I have sort of this unintended way of tracking how often I go to the gents while I was at, at, at that particular client. So data sets can be sort of really interesting if you just think of other creative ways or things they don't represent or things they do represent in sort of those abstract ways and so um don't just think because you don't have something that you can't start tracking it you might actually be able to use the fact that you don't have something to start tracking that exact thing in the case of sleep all i need to do is export my step data and figure out when I stop walking and when I start walking in the morning. And I can estimate my sleep roughly in between those two things. So the first thing I do when I wake up is grab my phone. And the last thing I do when I go to sleep is put my phone down. So that's a, another great way you can sort of use that data set to, to your advantage. Um, but that's it for me. I'm not going to sort of take up too much more time. Uh, there's plenty more ways you can do this kind of stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a really quick way with just photos that you can all get stuck in and start doing something um, straight away. Obviously, looking forward to um, some questions towards the end, if you've got any. But otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Ellie. Thanks, Tim. Um, I will be talking about um, similar things to you in that um, I'm talking about some of my Apple data, some of my health data, but I will be talking about um, some sport and health data. So I, um, I use Strava, um, Garmin data and Apple health data. And I'll talk about that in a bit in more detail um, in a second. But first up, I find that often it's very useful to talk more about why you're doing a this. So I'll be going through sort of where I started from and kind of, un kind of work out what the inspiration for all of this was. Then I talk through where I'm going to get the data from and how I actually did that and what I was left up with, up, what I was ended up with after I'd gathered all this data and I've got all of these metrics, what do I do there? So I'm generally interested in tracking data. Uh, I tend to track it all anyways. I've kind of always worn a wristwatch. I started off with a Fitbit, then moved on to the Garmin and I'm now on an Apple Watch. Um, so it's always been kind of vital for me to mesh these data uh, collection devices together to kind of get a full picture. And of course, then through, both, through all of those up on Sparta as well. Um, and as I mentioned in the intro, I just find it fascinating to find out patterns about yourself that you didn't necessarily realise. So I quite like tracking them. Um, but for this particular viz, uh, which is my Red January viz. I participated in Red January last year in 2020 with some other chill friends. Um, and it seemed like the perfect push, drive and inspiration for this, all of this data because, because I was doing it every day, I knew I'd be consistent. Uh, and because I kind of had semi-toyed with stuff before, I kind of knew what data I wanted to collect 
as well as knowing that there'd be other fields of data that I could pull in that I didn't necessarily think of at the time. Um, and I, they wanted to visit and it would then allow me to kind of uh, create a new viz on Tableau Public, but also a viz I was personally invested in. So where did I get this data from? Um, so I got, pulled a data export from Strava, which I will go through all of these in a second. Um, so from Strava, I got the activities, I got photos, I got comments, I got various stats. From Garmin, I got the activity as well, uh, as well as some geospatial data fields, which was fun for creating some custom maps. I then also did a big export of Apple Health. And so as Tim showed you before, the Apple Health can integrate with loads of different other apps as well. So it also had some of my Garmin wear, which was outside of each specific activity, like my steps for that day. I also have sleep cycles, so use that at various points, uh, as well as like an app called Clue, which I do from various different bits of data, like how I'm feeling and moods. Again, the data is not every day because similar to what Tim was saying, I don't, you only pick it up when you feel kind of, maybe when you feel a bit low or when you're experiencing something rather than day-to-day -day life. I then had these three bulk data exports and used Alteryx to bring them together into a Tableau hyperfile to visualize the data. So Strava, um, there's a link here, which is to go to your Strava account. You then log into the account and on the left upper right hand side, you go into settings and your account. And you can go down into the tab of download or delete your data. Um, this can seem quite scary because you don't want to accidentally delete your data, but you won't because there is an additional screen for that. But you then request your archive and you get sent an email with a link, which is great. Um, it looks like this. So I clicked on my profile at the top. You then go into your settings and then you click on account and down at the bottom here, you've got this download or delete your account. It comes up with another screen that's three different settings. You then select the second one and request your archive and it'll email it to whatever your account email address is. Um, and this is a really, really, really rich data source. You get a zipped folder with all your activities. You get some GPX formats ones, and they are for the spatial data. You also have CSV files with, you've got a few of them you can see here on the right. You've got a folder full of photos, various different activities, specific folders. And then you've got all of the different metrics by different, C, different CSVs. So for example, all of your comments are in CSV, your events that you've been to, whether you've been on a bike, what, what um, different things you use, like what trainers you use, if you tag that on Strava. So it's a really, really rich data source. Then Garmin. Um, so this is a, another different site um, that I use mostly for my running, but at the time I was using it as a day-to-day -day, um, watch and exercise tracker. Um, so in this one, it's a bit similar. You can do it in two different formats. You can either download it as a CSV file, um, which I believe you can do here. You have your main uh, dashboard. Uh, you click on activities on the left, and then you can go on the top right and export CSV. This will literally just give you a CSV export of the specific kind of the sheet you can see down here. Um, so that I did some running. You can then filter this so that it, say if you just wanted running or just wanted cycle rides, it would then export just the filter as well, which is quite useful. Or, which is what I did for this one, you can actually do a, a giant export of the data in one place rather than either going for an export in the CSV or going into every specific activity and downloading it. Because the CSV doesn't have any geographical data in it. Sure, it might have a start or end point, but it doesn't have every single kind of minute or second that it tracks your location. You'd have to go into each individual activity and download it that way. Whereas with the export, you actually get those GPX files as well, um, which is great. So again, in your account, you go to data management, export your data, and then request a data export. And again, this is emailed to you. My third data source was Apple Health, uh, which as Tim has kind of sent me shown as well, um, I have a lot of apps integrated in with this, which was his last screen on the right. But in your Apple Health, you click on your account and then you export all of your uh, all of your health data and you can send this to yourself in various different ways. I just did an email, which was fine and it was small enough to export. I then, once I had all that data, 
uh, I decided to go to the sketch board and work out what exactly did I want from this? What did I have? This was uh, an iterative uh, process. You can see the different colors of writing down what I wanted to work out. And this meant because of AlterX, which I'll go through in a second. And then I could go back and forth between this dictionary of fields that I had and the data and kind of um, summarize bits and pieces to get at different levels of the data. So some of the data is collected on the seconds level, but actually I just wanted a daily average. I could get Alteryx to do the heavy lifting before I went into Tableau. I then had additional data as well. So as I mentioned before, the photos folder from Strava was, was great. So in Alteryx, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is the workflow. This is the Strava section. And um, so this is the, as I said, the activities CSV. You've got various activity IDs, activity dates, uh, different names, different types. So whether I walked or ran, I don't cycle. Um, I'm not very good at it, so I just run. Uh, how long you were going for, I think in seconds, uh, various distances, relative effort, and various other things. And this is all of it. So it goes back from 2015, 2016, down to January, 2021. And first up, we notice that this is a text field. So I convert it into a date. And I do other things, sort of uh, filter to just January, January 2020, uh, and sort the comments out. So it also brings in the comments. Um, and I wanted to uh, pass out some of the characters. So because I, I would enter my or edit my runs on my phone, I use loads of different emojis. Uh, and it doesn't quite like that in the comments. I just edited a few of those out. I then summarized it so that I would just get my comments on what days it happened um, to make sure I had 31 or so entries uh, and then joined it back all together. Similarly with Garmin, I have a few different activities that kind of split them all out. But depending on the activity in my bulk download, I have a walking one, other the other classification, a running one, and a swimming one. So I unioned out these all together when I brought them in. And then this is, I did some date analysis and filtered out to just keep January. The top one is the TPX file. These have the latitudes and longitudes of all of the different time breakdowns and the activity ID. Um, when doing all of this, we can see, I hope you're on the map, that once you do some creating points and creating lines, we can see various different paths that create that it creates per um, activity, which is really great. Um, you can see some of my runs across London. And then in the summary, I also then wanted the start time, so the minimum time to get a joining calculus. I then joined the activity data back to the TPX data. My Apple section looks a lot larger because I use different aspects of it. So within Apple, Garmin also writes to my Apple Health, um, which is kind of this section here, uh, and gives us different data sources. So within um, Apple, you end up with this source name. So Connect is the Garmin app. So for all of my Garmin data, so what steps I've done that day, how far I've walked, I wanted it from the connect. You can also see some sleep cycle data uh, and various other bits as well, like Clue, I think is the app I mentioned earlier, um, as well as the iPhone. So I broke this down into different sections. So the top section is all broken out into Garmin. So this is my energy burned. So we can see all of my calories I burned that day to see if I wanted that. And then all of these prep sessions are mostly date analysis because it's stored in the text file. I then also got the distance I'd walked that day. I then got a heartbeat analysis, which is pretty cool um, every minute. Um, but again, I wanted a daily average for this as well. So I summarized it to get the average and median across the day. The steps analysis. Um, so the steps is interesting as well because I wore my Garmin watch. I also collected it on my phone. So some days I would have my phone on me more than my watch if I was um, kind of just in the mornings or whatever. Um, versus my phone. So in Tableau, I think I did it in Tableau in the end, was working out which one was greater, the steps from my watch on the steps from my phone. And to boost the data, I then took the maximum from either, either set. 
um, but it was quite interesting to see the difference. And again, I've got uh, for every entry, so every kind of minute or 15 minutes versus uh, a daily entry as well. I also then got my sleep data from the sleep cycle. And this is interesting as well, because you've got two sections for this data, because you've got some of the analysis from this app was in bed versus asleep. So that was quite interesting as well, because it, um, the app itself analyzes uh, via vibrations on the bed or snoring noises or sleep noises, um, whether you're actually just in bed because you start the analysis and then it works out when you went to sleep. So I could work out how broken my sleep was as well. So this is then joined all together again. And I could do various different tweaks to it and eventually join it and sort it together into Tableau. So my final viz looks something like this. Where um, similar to the whiteboard before, I've got my calendar days and I've got various different information, summary information. So you can see here, I've got some date data. I've got 31 days. I've got some headline stats that then change when you filter. I've got my photos from Strava. I've got a map. So I made this to align with the red every day, run every day, January colors. So you can do that in map box. So I've got my geospatial maps. Uh, and then also I've got my heart rate and my cumulative steps across that day. And what was really cool as well was through Garmin and the time periods for start and stop, I could work out and isolate the actual activity time. So I got the activity time for the actual steps as well as the heart rate as well, which was pretty cool. And then I also created a statistics page where I could drill down into some of the metrics I mentioned and see if there was any trend between the two, which was pretty cool. So that was my uh, quantified self and how I um, managed to bring all those data sources together into one final viz. Um, so I think we'll be going through some questions towards the end, but for now, I will hand over to Jenny. Thanks so much for that, Ellie. Gosh, so much work that you did. Um, I feel bad that I'm just going to be talking about Fitbit now. Um, so let me share my screen with you. So we're just going to be talking for my part of the talk about connecting to the Fitbit API. Um, so the desire to look at the Fitbit API for me came from kind of just a random thought I had one day. I guess that's where most uh, data viz ideas come from. And I was wondering if I'd slept any better in 2020 than in 2019, because 2019 was, you know, my first year of working in London. Um, I was commuting in. So I thought, well, well that's probably going to be a lot less sleep, you know, just through all that travel and, you know, dinners with friends, that sort of thing. And then 2020 obviously came along and it was a bit more uh, staying at home. <laughs> so um, I wondered if I could answer that question. And that's the kind of teaser that I'll use to get you through to the end answer once I've got all the data from there. So my first thought was to look at um, Tableau and see if I could just use the web data connector itself to, in order to get my data. So if I show you what that's like, um, so that's the web data connector. If you just click on it, then it says, okay, you know, connection Tableau desktop. So if we go ahead to Tableau desktop, if you've never used a web data connector before, then it's in this section of connecting to a server. And it's basically just built by someone off of the Fitbit API itself. Um, so I thought, hey, can I just simplify my life here and not have to do all of the connecting myself? So if I um, go ahead and use this web data connector here, then I think it'll just ask me to authenticate. I think I'm already signed in on my browser to Fitbit potentially. So it might not ask me to enter this. No, well, okay, that's fine. Um, so let me just type in my email address and password. Jenny, yeah. just sharing your PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Let me, how did I manage that too? How did two of us make the same error? Um, is that now sharing my whole screen? Yeah, that, that's better, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, anyway, <laughs> what I was doing there was I just went ahead to Tableau desktop. I went to connect to a server and you've got this web data connector option down at the bottom. Then I just pasted in the little pop-up window um, the URL that I showed and I think Lorna pasted it in the chat as well. Um, so that's 
cool, that's the um, how you connect by the web data connector. And all it asked me to do was sign into my Fitbit account, which I did. And you get to choose the number of days that you want to um, have that data for, but it only goes up to a maximum of 150. So this was the part where I thought, ah, oh, what could have been so easy? Um, it's not, but perhaps for your own personal questions that you might have on quantified self, that would be enough for you. So that's definitely an option of how to get your Fitbit data into Tableau quickly. And I'll just show you an example of the data it gives you. So I'll just do it for seven days, just for um, sake of um, a smaller data set to work with and quickly show you. So as we're concerned with sleep, you can see there's lots of different things that it would give you there, calories, distance, elevation, but we're just gonna look at sleep quickly. And it gives you just four fields there. So it'll basically just give me a time that, you know, I went to sleep or when I was awake or when I was um, in light sleep, deep sleep, and just that kind of second by second um, breakdown. So that's great. That's enough to do quite a lot of analysis. Um, but my issue there, the reason I was wanting to connect to the API in the first place and get all that data was that I kind of wanted to do quite a uh, longer analysis of time periods. So um, what next? Let's head back to the PowerPoint slide and talk a little bit about the Fitbit API and how I then had to learn how best to connect to that. So there's quite a lot of different things that we need for that. That's why I thought it'd be good to just talk it through step by step because the documentation that I kind of found online, the confusion between uh, client ID and user ID, it confused me a lot and trial and error, let's pass on the knowledge in a <laughs> simpler way, hopefully. So to get this information, you just have to go to this dev.fitbit.com. And again, it's going to ask you to log into your Fitbit account, which that's all auto filled, which is lovely. And what you'll see here is that currently I have this application set up for when I built the viz, which is called Sleep Stats. But let's go ahead and create a new one together. So you just have to register an app up here. And basically, a lot of these fields don't matter. So you can kind of call them anything you like. So the application name I will call demo for connecting. There we go, it's already auto filling it for me. Um, and I'll just call this again, demo for all tricks. And it's gonna ask you for quite a lot of websites that it's kind of like, what, what, what are you doing with it? Um, you can point it to a lot of, uh, most people just point it to one that they kind of run themselves. So that's what I've chosen to do here too. It's kind of just to authenticate um, and make sure that you're, you know, not doing this on a mass scale, I guess. It's just a one person doing it. And so I'm just going ahead and using that email, uh, that website that you know I know is kind of fine to point it at. And then here's the interesting part that you might want to think about. Um, it's asking for your application type of how you want to connect. So I'm just using it for personal and this controls the amount of data you can get down. Um, so I think if you're doing a client level, it'll only give you daily averages. Whereas if you're looking at it on a personal level, it's gonna give you, you know, your minute by minute data. Um, or so you can click on each of these yourself to learn more about them. But for me, I'm just interested in what I can get. So I'm just gonna go ahead and show you how to do that. The callback URL is interesting, it's just, you can use anything. Again, I'm going to use Google. Um, it's just where it's going to paste in the header of our URL.com mm -hmm. before. I'm sure it wouldn't matter, but I'll show you how that works in a second. So usually I just um, would want to be looking at this by read only because I'm trying to get the data for myself. But it's interesting that you could write the data back yourself to Fitbit. It's not something I've explored myself, but perhaps if you're wanting to write between various applications and trackers. But anyway, for now, we're just gonna read only and agree. And this will give us our client ID. If it's going to load, there we go. same name already exists. Okay, we'll just put a two. I must have named it exactly the same thing earlier today when I created it. There you go. Perfect. 
So now we have our uh, client ID. So I'm just going to save that in a notepad to keep a track of it. Let's just copy and paste that. Cool. To remember hey. what the other things. Jenny, sorry, we just lost you a second there. Ah. Um, just Apologies. no, it's fine. Just uh, remind me, remind us what you said, and, and maybe just turn your camera off because your internet's just a little bit. So, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Um, so, basically, all we were doing there was filling out these fields that you can see once I've pressed OK on there. So, um, we've got our client ID now. And what we were putting in that callback URL section was google.com, and you'll see why we did that in just two seconds. So um, what we now need to look for is our access token and our user ID. So we've got our client ID. We've just got two more things that we want to go and grab. So we use this little link at the bottom of the page here, and it'll show us that information again. And we're just going to use this auto-generated link to authenticate and to give us our, these tokens that we'll need. It's going to ask us to allow all. Um, I'm just going to allow all, even though I only want sleep, just for the sake of ease. And then you'll see it's taken us to Google. But the URL for Google isn't just google.com. It's got a lot of information in. So I'll copy and paste that into Notepad to show you how that looks. OK, that's not given me all of the data that I was hoping for. <laughs> Great. When you do things live, uh, they never go as smoothly as you do them in practice, do they? Um, so let me try that again, see if it works a second time, allow all. It's still not giving me all of the <laughs> access token. So um, what basically should have happened there it's not a problem. I can kind of explain what should have happened is that we should have had our URL here and then we would have had a parameter for our access token, a parameter for our user ID, a parameter for our scope. And this is all the information that we would be needing to um, extract it and to use to connect in Alteryx. So let me show you what we would be looking for um, via PowerPoint, sorry, just so that um, that makes a bit more sense as to what information should have been there. So basically in that URL, we should have had this authorization, which was our access token, our user ID, and our scope, which we would have put into our download tool. So, um, that's all good. What we're wanting to do basically is we're wanting to use the API now itself. So we would need to have a little bit of a look at the documentation. So if I click on the API documentation there, then it, this is just looking at the sleep um, section. So you could click on any of these links and it gives you a example of how to format your request. And that's nice and useful very kind of intuitive I found using the actual API once I'd gotten the to grips with the whole user ID versus um, versus a client ID, etc. So we'll just take this and we're going to paste it into a uh, text input tool in Alteryx. So I've already done that here. My user ID, um, that would have been, it would have been come from the URL of that Google page. And that is what I would be entering into here. If I just uh, zoom in on that there for you, that's where I would have been putting the user ID. And then that information about the um, client ID and the, um, the access token would have been put into here. So you'd need to have the word bearer and then a space and that access token. that. It would be a big long string, um, the user ID, and the scope is then the client ID. So I can show you an example of um, from the other um, setup that I had. You saw I had two applications on there. So let me show you that here. In the headers section, we have that access token, the user ID, 
and the client ID. And that's how we can now connect to our data or my data, should I say. <laughs> um, so I won't talk you through too much of the workflow, but basically rather than just having it connecting to one date at a time, I wanted it to connect all throughout 2019, 2020. And I just broke them down in different date ranges because I know that there is a limit on the API, which is, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but it just, it just helps to break it down into those little chunks and then make it one URL to then go ahead and download and get all of our data out of in a JSON format. For me, I was looking mainly at main sleep versus deep sleep, doing a little bit of cleaning up and where there was missing information where maybe uh, sometimes if you haven't charged your Fitbit all the way, then um, it doesn't give you the deep sleep breakdown. So I kind of just imputed those missing values in all tricks with an average. Um, and that meant that in the end, I could answer that question that I was talking about at the beginning, which was, did my sleep quality improve in 2020 versus 2019, given that I didn't have much better to do than sleep? Um, and the answer is at a very top level that I got more sleep on average, but I got less deep sleep. So the quality of my sleep wasn't as good. Um, and I did a little bit more deeper analysis too around like time of bed. Does that affect the deep sleep? And Yes, naturally, the earlier you go to bed, the better sleep quality you're going to get. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my journey with Quantify itself. And I know that we've got not too much time left, so I will stop there and let all the questions be, be asked now. So thanks. Amazing, amazing. Um... Honestly, like I'm always constantly amazed whenever anyone shares their workflow to do with um, quantified self because it's always so different. Even though it's the same sort of data sets we all connect to, we all put a personal flair to it and it's, it becomes really, really interesting. So um, thank you. Thanks uh, for reminding me there, Lorna, about the camera. Um, okay, so we have some questions now. Um, let, me, let, me, um, let me just uh, share... Let me put this on full screen one second and we can just share this as we go through the questions because that makes sense. Um, this is rather bizarre. Um, There's one thanks. question in the Q&A. Do you want me to start with that one? Go for it. Yeah, why not? Um, Ellie, take up, take the question in the Q&A uh, whilst I try and figure out Zoom because you'd think I'd know uh, how to sure. use it really. So Stephen Void has asked if I had any specific challenges in the Ultrix workflow for the um, my quantified self bringing the three data sources together. Um, I think mainly no. It was just getting it was more getting to grips with what data was actually there and what fields were there in amongst all of the different ways it was stored. I think the main thing was that the Garmin and Strava were okay because they were CSV files for the most part. The Apple export, which I forgot to say as well, was um, it's a big XML file. So as long as you read it in, in the input tool as an XML in the drop down for the file type, it's fine because it then knows to look out for the specific markers to break it into columns. After which it's fine because it then tells you the different columns. So that, once you got over that, it is fairly straightforward. It's just a, a lot of data manipulation. Cool, thanks for that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, um, I'm sure you both appreciate this like when you start this sort of journey you sort of don't know what you're going to find or what you're going to be asked to do and it's never the same thing across uh, sort of two very similar platforms everyone has a different way of authenticating downloading the data and even file formats right and um, yeah. they tend to be always very very different um cool just to go back to some of the uh, questions we we had um already um <laughs> is it scary finding some data about yourself uh, what, what do you guys think yes Definitely. Um, I think I was always quite shocked at how high my heart rate was, which uh, shows that I'm not that fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think one of the biggest fears I have is I, I you know, I always think that um, I know myself pretty well. And actually, it's quite commonly in quantified self, you discover that your perception of what you thought you know is actually not correct, right? Yeah, I think that the biggest uh, call out for me is that when you think oh I'm really tired oh I must have slept really badly and then you check and you're like 
oh, I, uh, I slept well. Maybe I'm just being a bit lazy today. <laughs> See, that's what put me off um, looking at my sleep. I used to track it every day with my Fitbit. Um, and I had to stop in the end because I'd wake up thinking I had a good night's sleep, but my Fitbit had told me I'd had a bad one. So then that made me feel more tired. So it can work both ways. It can, um, yeah. collection can help you collect more, but also can be a bit scary. Exactly. And that actually, sometimes intuition is actually enough, right? Like if you feel like you didn't get a good night's sleep and sometimes that's enough, you don't need the, 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 the data <laughs> to sort of back it up. Um, if you don't feel great, you don't feel great. So interesting. Um, uh, another question, do you recommend manual collection? If so, uh, how best to go about that? Um, I think uh, this particular question, someone's heard of dash buttons. So I think these are the Amazon dash buttons as ways of tracking uh, sort of uh, stuff. So uh, I don't know if one of you wants to start or I can go first. Um, sure, yeah, so I would definitely recommend that. I mm -hmm. personally use Google Sheets because it's up to date regardless of whether I do it on my laptop or my phone. Yeah. I have always tend to have my phone with me. So when I'm tracking stuff, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, Similar, like I mentioned the board games earlier. I do use it for that, but also use it for different things as well. Like I think I have a weight tracker as well. It's got a different few different metrics and stuff. So yeah, right. definitely recommend manual. Jenny, any recommendations there? I think like you said, Tim, I remember having like uh, mood tracking apps that I tried to use once and just never was consistent with them. I'm never that consistent if it's an app and I don't know why. Whereas if it's like a Google sheet, like Ellie was saying, that it's kind of more my thing that I feel like I want to update. Right. I right. don't I think that's just me being really uh, particular. <laughs> but no, Definitely. But there's also a construct to it. Because I think if you mm. build it and you structure it yourself, you're more, mm. you're more likely to have an affinity with the collection method, right? Whereas when you yeah. use something that someone else has built, sometimes you know it doesn't quite suit you and you don't have that sort of emotional connection with it because mm -hmm. you know you you ask yourself the questions and, and so on and so forth um i i always I, you know I, I think i said this in my talk i i know that i'm really bad at manually collecting things and that rules me out of certain data sets for example like qualitative data sets you know things like mood tracking you can really only capture that if someone asks you um so i sort of I don't do that because I mostly focus on passive. To me, I always sort of figure out that the passive um, story that you can tell is more compelling because it tracks way more consistently throughout sort of your daily life. Um, so when you go on a run, for example, you don't sort of track every mile. The reason that works so well is because the phone's tracking every single second. At the end of the run, you can get a detailed breakdown. And it's the same with passive tracking, you know those things running in the background are actually much, much, much better, um, if that makes sense. So that, that's my opinion, though. If you're trying to tackle something like, you know, your mood, you're going to need to do it manually. There's no sort of two ways around it. Um, great. Um, which device? Uh, I think uh, we have sort of a split between Garmin, Fitbit and Apple Watch on this call. <laughs> Right. Um, so maybe, maybe why did you arrive at this particular device you have, actually, um, as, a, as a question then? I guess for me, um, budget friendly right. is my, my thing. Right. Right. Um, I'm not very, I mean, I, I, now, nowadays I run, but back when I got my Fitbit, it was mainly just because it was on sale and I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's my <laughs> unspecific answer. <laughs> no. I had a similar entry, uh, or similar reason for why I started on the Fitbit was that I knew I wanted to start tracking it um, mm -hmm. and get my fit and my steps up given I had just started working in an office. But I found it wasn't great. I mean, the GPS was all right, but I wanted a bit more. I wanted to see what pace I was doing and a bit more specific run targeted right. analysis. So that's why I went for Garmin, which is quite a high, high point, yeah. price point. But then I found that because it has a lot of high tech in it for running and cycling and stuff, I found that every day I didn't necessarily want to connect that to it. I just didn't, want, didn't like the interface for my phone and stuff. Yeah. So my friend then found was selling his first uh, Apple Watch. So I thought I'd try that out as a, a watch, daily watch alternative. So I still mm -hmm. use my Garmin for running because I think the Apple Watch isn't as good GPS wise, but it yeah. might be an old Apple Watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like solid advice there. Like, 
I'd say to anyone starting out, just start with a Fitbit. It's so simple. It only needs charging once a week, critical yeah. factor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the consistency of the data will be far better. And then as you have more and more needs, maybe you want that watch to do something more than absolutely. If you're keen on running, then go down the running watch route. If you're keen on an all-rounder, maybe Apple Watch, but there's also other sort of smart watches out there that kind of do a lot of the things actually you'd want, um, at not as the same sort of cost as an Apple Watch. Um, the only advantage of the Apple Watch is it hooks into the apple ecosystem fairly well actually it's very very consistent and you sort of get lots of updates for free as such but um generally speaking i think all the devices track them to the same sort of standard quality because that's the same standard that's been around for a while okay we've got a um, couple more question um can weather data be used um in this context of data analysis um so um i don't know have you have either of you looked at weather uh, yeah, I love the weather. Uh, I haven't actually looked at it in the context of right. uh, comparison to my running or my health data, but it definitely would be easy to slot in. Yeah, I think uh, one of the best data sets that unfortunately is getting phased out was called mm -hmm. a Dark Sky. It's both an app on the iOS and it got acquired by Apple and they, they're sort of killing the API in June. So if you've got some weather data you want to grab it, do it before June. Um, it allows you to sort of export data via an API and it was really, really good. You can do historical date searches as well. The difficult thing with that is uh, aggregating the right level because obviously you're going to need mm. a specific point in time and location to ask the weather forecast for. So the more of that you do, the more of your API calls you use up. So it's probably wise to sort of have a really good idea of the location data you have first figure out what granularity you want to aggregate that to, both in terms of location and time. And then you can go and request sort of decent weather data with those sort of two things combined to give you like a good um, uh, batch of data that you can then generally use um, across the board. So um, that's a, another one to do. And then probably just one more. Um, the best data scrubbing tool from a website or other sources for data collection. Oh, this is tough. Data scrubbing tool. I guess we use Alteryx, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, we're right. We, be a bit we're very biased on this <laughs> topic. Um, <laughs> I, I will put a shout out to a very simple one, which is, um, you know, uh, uh, export tools, like literally going out and exporting things. Um, it's an uncommon one, but HTML scraping is also very easy to do, especially with Python. I say easy, I mean, okay, you have to put a bit of time understanding the Python tools or the scrapers out there that can scrape HTML. But actually, once you've done that once, that's something you can use across the board. Um, so something I've done with Vitality Health Insurance, they give you points based on exercises that you do. And I've actually been able to scrape mm. their point system out oh, of their system cool. and then analyze whether or not their point system actually works. And I figured out it doesn't work because in order to beat the point system, all I had to do was walk my dog twice a day. And that's something I did anyway. So <laughs> I just, I literally just got the watch and I just did that and I got like platinum very, very quickly. And actually it's been interesting to see how they've changed the point system over time. So you can sort of visualize that. So the way I did that is I just grabbed, I went to the page, I scrolled all the way to the bottom. So it loaded all the information and I just copied and pasted the whole page as a HTML, saved the file. And then I just scraped that with another tool because I have a static copy of it now. Then I just scraped that in all tricks, but you could have used any HTML scraping tool siri doesn't understand but never mind um <laughs> <laughs> I, you could have used any hcmr scra uh, scraping tool to do that i was just going through div tags essentially so that's another thing you can do the copy and paste method i know it sounds crude and it sounds painful but actually if the data is worth it and you really want to answer that question then it's a really really good way to go okay just to jump in there i just posted a link about google sheets um, Google Sheets has something called import range. Right. And if there's a table on a website, you can reference the table um, via Google Sheets. Oh, amazing. So that'll keep it nice and refreshed um, inside your Google Sheets based on the website. So definitely take a look at the import range um, for Google Sheets. That's a great, that's a great show. Always, it's always a great data source for Tableau business anyway, because it keeps a live update, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the method I think uh, both uh, Ellie and Jenny have mentioned, which is, you know, Google Sheets and Tableau has a native connector to Google Sheets and off you go. That's it. Or you can even use the Google Drive connector as well to connect to that sheet if you wanted to, or a bunch of sheets, um, as, as it were. So 
but it's really really good um sort of ways of approaching that um but um i think we're, we're pretty much just over time uh, we started a bit after uh, five so yes we we correct to finish it's a bit after five thanks everyone um for joining us um i'd just like to sort of draw your attention to what we have going on next week um obviously if you go to our meetup page meetup.com forward slash let's talk data and we have a whole host of events and um, specifically next week we actually have um uh if i just scroll down here we have another webinar on the quantified self um uh basically about next steps and i'm going to be joined uh by two more colleagues Nicole and alice who'll be talking a bit about uh, their experience experiences as well so definitely uh, head to meetup.com forward slash let's talk data and um, sort of get involved with that along with all our other events um, that we have here at the information lab so yeah meetup.com is where, it at, where it's at thank you so much for joining um, and we'll catch you in the next event um, uh, thank you for your participation as well today very patient crowd and we'll see you soon thanks all thanks everyone bye